Today I get to sit with my great friend, a, a very powerful player, Miss Lori Ulm. And what a privilege right out of the gate. I, um, I want to tell everybody just before we even get into the word that Lori, I've had the privilege of knowing and, and working with one-on-one -on -one and you're always on time. So much so that, that I just learned that you drove up near the hangar last night, <laughs> got, got a hotel room, which might be a stretch <laughs> if you want to call it a hotel, but it, you got a room and stayed here just so that traffic and all the variables that could possibly make you late aren't going to happen. And I really appreciate that. That's, that's extraordinary commitment to being here to being in this space at this time, and we're going to have fun. Uh, Lori, this podcast, as you know, it it starts with a word, and everybody will understand this word by the end of our time together <laughs> as it relates to you. But the word is heart, heart. And, and of course, there's a lot of contexts. Heart can find itself in a lot of sentences. <laughs> but for the purposes of this of this podcast, it would mean it would mean the literal version mm -hmm. of heart, like this organ in your chest, heart, mm -hmm. and the idea of putting your entire soul and self into what it is that you're putting your heart mm -hmm. into. And I think all that will be clear as we walk our way through. So thank you for being here. Um, I, I want you to take us way back. I want you to take us way back to your childhood, to the influences that first surrounded you. I always like to probe, like, where did extraordinary come from? What, what were the lessons? What were the influences? What, what was the hard drive? How did it get formed? Did you overcome it? Did you agree with it? You know, these sorts of things, because I'm fascinated with how extraordinary people get to this place that guys like me admire. How did it happen? Take me to your childhood. Well, first of all, I'm so honored to be here, Greg. You've been a blessing in my life. And if I can contribute anything to your journey, it's that's a gift you, to me. So you thank are, you for inviting me. You are, many people's thank right you. now. So thank you very much. Let's so, hear it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I can say that my childhood is not something that you would read in a Dr. Sears parenting book. And um, I kind of take that to heart because um, I don't think you would design a life, I don't think you can design your life so carefully that it would come out in the way that it came out for me. Hmm. I don't think my mom was at home reading baby books on how to raise. <laughs> we were just getting through it, you know? And hmm. Um, hmm. I had an incredible mother who hmm. loved me beyond measure. Hmm. And um, she was the constant in my childhood. And she told me one time, there has never been a mother who loved their child more than I love you. And when she said that to me, I believed it. Hmm. And um, hmm. that's an unlikely truth, but I believed it. And um, hmm. because hmm. mothers love their children, but she just had an enormous love for her kids. Hmm. And we had, um, uh, we had a lot of challenges growing up, hmm. but that constant was my mother's love and her faith in God. Hmm. And, um, and that was just the foundation upon which I thrived. And, mm. uh, you know, I was born on my grandma's ranch, a 1,400-acre ranch in eastern Oregon uh, on the John Day River. Wow. Um, and it was a beautiful place to live as a young kid. It's rattlesnake country, mm. rim rocks. Uh, I learned from a very young age to do dangerous things. <laughs> I learned to carry a knife and a gun and, uh, you know, wear ankle-high boots because there were rattlesnakes out there and we would pack a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and, and a long stick and wear our ankle-high boots and go stomping around out in, you know, <laughs> from a very young age. My cousin Dee and I would go out and I remember she was having a day one day and boy, she could have a day. 
and she was just ticked off. And she came back over to me and she said, I just stomped a rattlesnake. And we were probably, I don't know, seven. And I don't know if she did or she didn't, but I believed it. <laughs> I believe she would. <laughs> right. I just stomped a rattlesnake. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, the, uh, that's the average, you know, day walk for a seven-year-old. Yeah, in Why not? Right. <laughs> right. Let's go out there and more where bash I out now. a snake right, this morning. Right. You know? And we would hike up to the Rim Rocks, and we would go swim in the John Day River. And, and hmm. um, we would go out to the fields and help change the sprinklers at that time, um, you had to physically move these great big giant sprinklers in the fields, and um, but it was it was not an easy life. And I was out there from when I was pretty young. Um, most of the times I remember were coming back to visit my aunt Mary, my dad's sister, and um, but we grew up around that kind of. And I'm not sure when he, when public utilities hit that area, uh, but it was after I was born. If it gives you an idea of what life wow. was like out there. Wow. Um, but we, you know, we moved off the my grandma's ranch. And my grandma was a force, too. She bought that 1,400 acres. She went to college in Salem and went back out and bought 1,400 acres on her own before she ever got married. And and then um, she worked that land her whole life. So your, and, your grandmother went to college and... Okay, because back then that wasn't all by itself. That wasn't that. Normal. She was a force, and yes. then went and bought real estate before on ever getting own. married on her own. As an eighteen, okay. nineteen-year-old girl, there's a gene pool and right there. Yes, that explains some things. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. I have own landership, own land ownership. Excuse me, in my blood, and yeah. I don't know how else to do it. Yeah. Um, there's. Uh, and we have a pretty matriarchal family on that side. Mm -hmm. um, I have three sides to my family, uh, and that's my dad's side. And um, but we moved off the farm and we uh, off the ranch rather, and um, and kind of tried to make it on our own. My dad was the oldest of eight kids, and he took everything as his responsibility, which is something he passed on to me as the oldest child. Um, everything was his responsibility. Everything was under his purview. Uh, and that's a hard place to be, but it's also, um, it was his expectation of himself. It was his expectation of me. And How um, many siblings do you have, Lori? I have three siblings. Okay. Um, You're the oldest and my of dad four was, then. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I'm the, I am the oldest of three. Oh, and okay. I, we've, we, okay. Um, and my dad... You know, we we lost my sister, but my dad, um, he didn't ever really get used to living off the farm. I think he was probably born 100 years too mm -hmm. late, but he was the hardest working man you could imagine. He could grab a hold of something and pick it up, like that, that hand strength and arm strength that mm -hmm. you only get from working very hard. Doing it and, every day. And, yeah. um, and he... That was instilled in me, very hard work, not just mm -hmm. physical work, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, like I said, my grandma had her college degree and she was the teacher at the one room schoolhouse and, and they studied music and philosophy. And when you, um, when you came home at night, you were reading or playing music and mm. um, there was this learning, this love of learning as a gift, not as something, oh, I have to go home and read, but like I get to go home and Mm -hmm. Read. My brother's name is Galen, and um, huh. I'm deviating now, but uh, I've been studying um, Stoicism, hmm. the philosophy of Stoicism. I've studied a lot of different philosophies, and I was reading just last night about Marcus Aurelius and his relationship with his doctor, um, and his doctor's name is Galen, and hmm. I realized, I had always been told that my brother was named after a, the like originator of Western medicine, Galen. Um, hmm. But what I didn't realize was that he was Marcus Aurelius's doctor. And Marcus Aurelius was one of the, um, was a very famous, one of the most famous sto Stoics hmm. in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. And my dad would have been reading Stoicism to come about that name. Right. It's not a common name. No. And it was, 
it told me something about my dad hmm. Um, hmm. that I knew that he was he studied philosophy, but it was um, an interesting thing because I lost my dad when he was 36 years old. And um, I was 10 years old and he was my hero. He had this jet black hair and bright blue eyes and he was just muscular, but not bodybuilder muscle. Mm -hmm. Strong, lean. functionally right. strong, long, lean arms. Yeah. Um, and uh, At 36, he, was, he passed away. And he was Superman. He was my first love. He was um, the strongest man in the world to me. And it was inconceivable that he could be gone. Um, hmm. But he was, and he was gone overnight. He was, we lost him to sudden death, and um, it shook my world. Hmm. And it shook, it shook all of our worlds. I was 10, my brother was eight, my sister was four. And um, mm. my mom was 30, and she has three young, unreasonably energetic <laughs> children and a high school diploma, and she's living in Prineville, Oregon. And uh, it was hard. Her and I were a mess. Um, we had a rough year <laughs> that year that my dad died. Uh, there was just the confusion of losing someone so strong and healthy. And so uh, young. And so mm -hmm. young. Um, and we have heart disease in our family, and we weren't sure at that time if he had it or not, but um, he did, and that became very quickly apparent. Um And as the oldest, I learned to, um, I became very protective of my mother and my siblings, and we all got through it together, and it was not easy. Um, and about a year later, my mom met Tim, and um, Tim is my dad now. He raised me and my brother and my sister, and... Um, he was just this big, burly guy. You know, my mom t met him at church camp because that's where you go to find <laughs> That's where she went. And she went to a, a retreat for um, for adults, and, and she met this guy, Tim. And he's just, to raise someone else's kids, um, to take on a broken family, uh, I just have so much respect and love for him because it was not easy we were still grieving our father mm -hmm. and we were not easy <laughs> mm -hmm. kids for a while and he loved us through it and he was you know I, I just was aghast when i first met him because my mom took us to his church he had this he went to this little church and um where they were it was kind of a hippie church if you will and he's up there playing his guitar and singing his incredible um four octave range voice and he's up there singing and he has a big beard and he's tall and you know and um blonde and and uh but uh, you know we all we all got through that together and and again um Tim was unshaken by our rottenness because I think we were just trying to test and see what he could take um and we were just and uh and he could take a lot, and he just loved us through it, and he he taught us how to work hard. He was one of the most disciplined men I ever, I, I mean, he's still around now. He's, of course, and he um, he gets up every morning, five, six o'clock in the morning, does his devotions, plans his day, goes to work, he, incredibly disciplined, and he taught us to be very disciplined, and I, I wasn't always grateful for that <laughs> because uh, our parents were strict, and they had high expectations. and um, But they also knew that we could do it. There was never a question. Like, yeah, I expect a lot from you because you you can do a lot and you damn well better. You know? And that was how it was in our family. Right. And you are, they, they taught us service. I've never known anybody that was more service-oriented than my parents. 
Um, and we were always out on some kind of doing this for this person or that for that person. And my parents would bring in what I called strays. We had people living with us, you know, that were like, there was a pastor in the church and his wife took off and left the baby. And so my mom took care of that baby for two years. And um, th they just had a heart for people. And when they retired, they went to Africa for six years. Um, my mom started an orphanage that she just recently went back and visited that has 40 kids and 10 adults who wouldn't have any place to go either. And, um, and she started that and she's still raising money back here in the States to keep, keep it going. And, um, and my dad uh, helped facilitate seven wells. They could have just flown back and done their business and come back home, but they stayed there for six years. And they continue to go back and love on those people and care for them. Um, and uh, they just have a real heart for humanity. See, I, I, I listen to this and because I know you and I know what your life looks like and I know your philanthropy and I know your involvement in all kinds of things. You see, I think that my conclusion, and I'll, I'll help others get there because maybe they don't know as you all as I do now, but, but what we see modeled, we, even, if, even if we're resistant to it at the time, even if it, it feels like, wow, you're giving this so much attention, you know, what about me or this or that? You know, kids have these selfish thoughts and, and of course you're in the middle of a huge transition dealing with this, right? This new person and this new life and, right? But, but what was being modeled back then when they had no time and they couldn't afford it has carried them through. It was who they were. And I think it's so interesting that, that the, the best of what I'm just hearing is now who you are, right? Absolutely. You, you, you believe in the same things. You, you've ratified that now from a, a, a mature perspective that this is who I want to be. And um, modeling, they, nobody remembers what you say, but they sure remember what you do. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. We didn't yeah. always love that dad was at work 14 hours a day, six days a week. Yeah. Um, but when he was off work, he came home. Yeah. And we went to church on Sunday, mm -hmm. his one day off. Mm -hmm. We got up, we went to church, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, it, there was very little teaching that he had time to do. Mm -hmm. But if you think we didn't see that happening mm -hmm. and apply that to our own lives as this is the expectation, right. you know, um, and uh, yes, it was. Um, but the other thing that happened in my childhood is we lost my sister. Um, unfortunately, all three of us kids got the heart disease that my dad had. And so at 13, um, I was diagnosed and all three of us kids were in the room and my mom, the doctor told my mom, well, Lori has the heart disease. It's an electrical condition. The structure of her heart's okay, but it'll probably go haywire when she's in her teenage years and she may not make it. And, but if she makes it past that, she'll probably be okay. And my mom was furious. She snatched us up and she told that doctor, don't you ever talk to my kids like they're not in the room. And as we left, she explained to us, that's just an old country doctor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He has no idea what's coming down the line. And she was right. I've had my life saved a number of times from technologies that were not available at that time that nobody could have foreseen. And she taught me to just have faith that I don't have to have all the answers right now. You just keep moving forward and let that go because he doesn't have the answers and uh, huh. you can't let that dictate how you live your life. Yeah, and even inserting, it's almost like it can become like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If, oh, you, if absolutely. you agree with it, oh, I'm, I've right. only got this much time, or oh, well, then you see it people can. like let go and quit trying because that's what they were told. But your mom wouldn't allow for that. Not only that, she would still, I don't know how she did it, honestly. I would, I think I'd be tempted to hold my kids in the house and never let them go. But knowing that all of us had this heart disease that had taken her husband. And she, like I said, we were 
she let us go out into the world and do, um, you know, she never showed fear about it and she never taught us to show fear about it. Um, she taught us faith Hmm. and, um, you can be in faith or you can be in fear, but you're not in both. And so we, we learned faith I, I and wanna, we wanna, acted boldly in the again, face of slow. that. Slow, you can be in faith or you can be in fear, but you can't be in both. They're mutually exclusive. Wow. And, um, and you know, about, I was 13 when I was diagnosed. I was 20 when my sister died and we were all at home together. Um, we all had dinner together, which was a gift because I didn't live at home. I'd come to visit. And we were messing around like we always mess around. Uh, we had a very, very energetic family. We were young, very high energy. And so we were just fooling around and playing around. And I, my sister and I got up and we were chasing each other around. And I chased her out the door. Um, and it was dark. It's winter time. It was October 3rd. Uh, in the Northwest, so it's dark out early, and uh, I couldn't find her. And when I found her, she had passed. And um, it it huh. it was too late to bring her back. Was it like um, like a like a heart attack? Of yes, sorts? Mm -hmm. she oh. died of sudden cardiac arrest. Oh my! She was fourteen, um, which is the age my son is right now, and I can't imagine losing a fourteen-year-old. It's they're just. Uh, and um, wow. shortly after that, my brother and I got defibrillators. They were new. They weren't something that was, uh, again, it was something that nobody had ever heard of. And those defibrillators saved my life a, a year and three months after I got it. Um, and so that was something I never could have foreseen. It wasn't even FDA approved when we got them. Um, and uh, so I've had this you know, vine of swinging from one vine to the next. Uh, hmm. Somebody gave me their heart. I, you know, when my heart failed, um, somebody else gave me their heart. And that's, there are no words to describe the gratitude that comes along with that or the um, sense of responsibility. Um, if the sense that you will be cared for and that if it's not your time, there's nothing that's going to take you. And if it is your time, there's nothing that's going to stop it. And so go boldly, <laughs> you know, but also recognize that time is short. Hmm. The clock is ticking. Hmm. Get on it. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of urgency that I've always had. Get on it. Mm -hmm. Time is short. There are no guarantees. Hmm. And be bold. Get out there. Do what you're meant to do. Leave a mark. Hmm. Enjoy your days. So, so Lori, you, you, were, you were 14 when you were diagnosed. 13, 14, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, and so this, this awareness, it, it wasn't a fear. You had a lot of faith. But there was this awareness that, okay, I'm dealing with something that most aren't. Um, and, and this sense of urgency, this sense of do it now, it was, as you said, like a clock ticking. Um, how long, I, I know this, but how old were you when you had a complete heart replacement? I was 49. 49. And I'd had 14 surgeries at that point. 14 heart surgeries on your own, mm -hmm. your own heart. Yes. But then coming to where that wasn't going to work anymore. That's correct. And now it was, here we go. We're going this route. Tell me about, tell me about that crossroads right there. You're a mom at that point. You're married. You, you know, this, your life's established. And here you are. Now, here comes number 15 heart mm -hmm. surgery. I had obviously had a very long road, um, starting from open heart surgery at age 20. Uh, I talk about getting a defibrillator and what you think of as a defibrillator right now, completely different thing than what it was back then. It was open heart surgery. They sewed patches onto your heart. The device 
was 12 ounces. It wouldn't fit in your body. I mean, this was an extreme surgery that most hospitals never would agree to do because it was uh, very extreme. It was yeah. in some ways harder than my transplant. Um, and then I'd uh, gone on to have several other surgeries. I'd had, uh, you know, some terrifying experiences. I had a blood clot in my heart and I had come very close to uh, dying at that point, very close. Um, and my doctor just saved me within a split second. He recognized what was going on. And, um, and I'd had a few other near-death experiences, but I never, I had this unreasonable faith that I would be okay. And um, when my doctors told me your heart is completely failing and we can't fix it. There is nothing that we can do. That was straight up terrifying. I had a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and a husband that I wanted to grow old with and I wasn't gonna make it. There was nothing they could do. And um, and I knew that they were right because I was very sick. I had been able, I used to tease my brother, we may have heart disease, but at least we're good looking, you know, because nobody can see what your heart looks like. And right. people didn't, I went most of my life without ever telling anyone that I had heart disease. As when we were kids, we moved around all the time. And so people didn't get the idea that we had heart disease. And I never told people, I didn't tell people in corporate America. And, um, it wasn't obvious that we had heart disease to other people, so I could be kind of a denier. But at this point, huh. there was no denying to anybody that I was dying. It was obvious. Huh. And um, I spent about three months getting up, taking my kids to school, coming home, sitting in my window, uh, in our house, it overlooks Lake Washington and the Olympic Mountains. It's just beautiful. And just looking out into nature, because nature puts me in my place, right? It makes me right-sized, if you will. And I cried all day, and I prayed. Um, and I got to a point where I handed my kids over to God. And I remember my mom telling me, the hardest thing I ever did was hand you kids over to God. But I knew you were in his protection, and I could... And that's what allowed her to move forward and just let us live our life. She said, it's in your hands. And I had to do that with my kids. And it was gut-wrenching, the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but in the end, I knew that um, I have an amazing husband. I trust him to raise those kids and to find another amazing person to raise those kids. I've always had pe the right people in my life, people who loved me and cared for me and mentored me. And I knew that my kids would too. And I was so sad that it wouldn't be me. Um, but I had faith in the fear one way and it took me a while to get to the faith that they would, um, they would all be okay and it would be hard I've always told our kids we can do hard things. I know this is hard, honey, but we can do hard things. Because it is hard. It's hard having a sick mom. Um, and, uh, you know, at that time, Alex, my nine-year-old, he and I were so close. We've always been so close. He, um, uh, he, he'd be my little runner. We had, I couldn't run up and down the stairs. I couldn't walk up and down the stairs. I couldn't walk across the street. So he would be, he would get things for me and, we were driving to a friend's one night and he and his sister were sitting in the back seat and he said, mommy, are you getting a new heart? And I was like, okay, here we go. We're having the conversation. And I told Sophia, five-year-old Sophia, um, go ahead and go in, honey, to your friends. We'll be right behind you. And I said, yeah, honey, uh, mommy needs a new heart. My heart's worn out and, um, and I'm going to feel better when they give me a new heart. And, uh, he said, but mommy, you're not going to remember me. And uh, in his sweet little nine-year-old mind, he, uh, we tell our kids, you're in my heart. 
you know, and um, the essence of me he felt would be gone if they took my heart. And he struggled. I was on the list for three months, and he it was hard on his little heart, those three months. Um, hmm. Were you, but, were you, did you, I mean, was there an element, Lori, of... Can I, you're on a list, you're on a list for a heart donor, you're sick, this one's failing, this one's going to go. Is I, I've got to imagine, in, unless there was some guarantee of a backup, I, there, this immediately just like, wow, you know, you're, you're walking a ridge line and could go any second, and if the heart doesn't get here before you go... Is that a real thing? Is That's that... a very real possibility for any heart transplant patient. The yeah. type of heart disease I have is called dystolic dysfunction. Basically, heart... when the pump goes, the pump pumps, but it also sucks. Mm -hmm. It's a turkey baster kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. it, not only does it pump, but it sucks. And usually the pump goes. And if the pump goes, they can put a device, a, a mechanical device around your heart to help a pump. My heart was stiff and it wouldn't release it wouldn't relax to draw the blood back in and there's nothing they can do for that and so if your heart doesn't come in time th there are no other options mm -hmm. and um so it was kind of a double jeopardy for me i d not only does that happen every day in the united states that a mother a father a child dies from heart failure because there isn't an organ available to them. But having dystolic dysfunction means there's not a mechanical option either. Um, and I was in the hospital for two months because just, I was dying. Just waiting. Just waiting. And um, when that... What a... And I had a lot of peace when that call came in because I knew... I mean, at that point... You can be as scared as you want, but there there are no other options. <laughs> so, so um, I actually was at at peace when that happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell me about about the beautiful heart that you have mm -hmm. in you? I know that you remember and celebrate this person that that unfortunately passed away, but donated his heart. Yeah. Um, it's a hard thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's a necessary thing to talk about. Um, I, I feel a lot of love for that person and their family. Um, my family is a donor family as well, when we lost my sister. Um, and so I, one of the things about having challenges in your life is that you become uniquely qualified to help others who have been through those challenges. And you have a responsibility to do so. Um, because if you think hard things are if you think challenges are hard, try living a life where you've never meant anything and you've never done anything. Um, I would take my challenges any day. And part of my challenge is that I've had to suffer the loss of my dad and my sister to heart disease. And when I think about this family, um, I don't know what they went through, but I know that their loved one was gone suddenly like mine was. And I know what a jarring and painful thing that is. And I have a love for that family that is the same as the love for my family. And I would love to meet them someday. That has not happened. Um, it's a very personal thing. It can happen. Um, there's a third party group and I can write to them and try to contact the family. The family can write to the third party and try to contact me um, that and all parties have to agree um, because it's anonymous and um, that ha that loop has not finalized. I've written a letter to the family. 
um, and in their time, I may or may not meet them, but I have a lot of love and respect for whatever they decide. Um, I've had a lot of surgeries and I've had a lot of mechanical implants and it's different to receive the organ of someone else. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could get philosophical here and I, I won't, but what I will say is after my transplant, I had this thing called a PET scan, right? They, they, they're looking at the heart to look at the energy of the heart. And when you see that PET scan, I'm like, your heart's what, the size of your fist, right? Mm -hmm. Not on a PET scan. It's outside of your body. You can see the energy from the heart outside of your body. It's huge. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I'll just leave that mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of energy in your heart, more than in your brain, more than in any other place in your body. Wow. Um, wow. And I feel a connection to that family. I mourn very similar to um, how I mourn the, you know, the loss of my dad and my sister. The first year was incredibly hard. I hurt for them. I was very sick. Going through a transplant is about as hard as it sounds. Mm -hmm. Worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because the surgery itself is a lot. But then your body has to accept this new heart. And it's a dog fight. Mm -hmm. It's not pretty. There, there are a lot of medications that they have to put you on. And there was a time in the hospital where I knew that I was dying right then. And I wasn't going to make it. And I needed to say goodbye to my husband. And as much as I'd kept a strong face up until then, I didn't think I was going to get another chance. And I told him, honey... I'm not going to make it. I can't do this. Um, and he went and got a doctor, and they worked on me all night. And actually, it was a nurse. It was a nurse. Nurses are amazing. Uh, he went and got a nurse, and they worked on me all night. And I uh, recovered. You know, they, I pulled through it. But I honestly didn't. There wasn't anything in me that thought that I was going to make it through that. Um, and that's a gift, too, because I recognize that, um, again, life is short. Hmm. Get on it. Do you, do you feel, Lori, that you, I don't know how to put this right. I don't think anybody would, so I'm just going to go for it. Do you, do you feel a sense like you're living on, I don't want to say borrowed time, but on, do you feel like you have a, a free pass? Like this is extra innings that you get to play and is there a sense of bonus baseball here? Absolutely. There's that, a joy that, like, in it. I, I probably shouldn't be here and therefore, wow, I, this is more than I expected. Is, is there that feeling? So much so. I, I feel As that in knowing you. It's there's, like just, there's a, just an energy around <laughs> everything that it doesn't really matter what happens now. It, it's, it's all gravy. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Even a few difficult things we've gone through oh. coaching. It's like I'm going, I'm a lot more upset about this than you seem to be. I'll tell <laughs> you, know? you, there's very little that moves my gauge. Yeah. Um, Sean told me to tell this story. So yeah. um, he and I, he's like, this is how you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we... Uh, we took a vacation to New Zealand and Australia one year, and um, it's about a thirteen year, a thirteen hour flight to New Zealand. So we were going to uh, the south. I think we started on the South Island. Anyway, so um, we had been, and we were restless the night before and didn't sleep well before the flight anyway. And then we'd been up for thirteen hours traveling, and um, we we got into New Zealand, and he went into our bed and breakfast and we're both just <laughs> drunk tired you know right. and i'm uh he comes out and i'm gone and he's like oh god she wandered off right. <laughs> you know and um he goes around the corner and i'm standing in the middle of the road just looking up and he's thinking she's lost it <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and he comes out to kind of retrieve me, you know, right. and, uh, and I, I'm like, 
let's go do that. And I was looking up, and in New Zealand, they'll let you do crazy things. We're litigious here, and you, you can't, but these are the people who invented bungee jumping. So <laughs> they're just like, go kill your stupid self. You know what I mean? It's fine. And um, so I'm looking up, and these people are jumping off these incredibly steep mountains with paraglides. Par they're paragliding down. And yeah. these are the mountains that are in the Lord of the Rings, right? They're the Incredibles, maybe? I I don't remember the exact name of them, but they're very steep. And um, and he's like, why? And it's like, well, it's it's morning, it's after it's early afternoon, and we need to stay awake to get assimilated to the time zone. So let's go jump off a mountain. What else will keep with us awake? Parachute. Yeah, with a parachute. What could possibly go <laughs> wrong? Right. <laughs> right. I've never done that before, but let's go for it. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we go, we take a gondola and we take, you know, mm -hmm. various different transportation modes. Um, and then you just have to walk. And, and there's nothing for it. And um, and I'd gone through I may have been shortly out of surgery. Something was going on. Uh, I wasn't my best. So we get up there, and um, they're yelling, run, run. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't run any faster. And they're like, run faster. And in my head, I'm thinking, what am I thinking? I can't run any faster than this. What's going to happen if I don't run faster? But um, so there's this fear, and we ran off the side of the mountain, which is an intu an intuitive that is not an intuitive thing to do to just run off the side of a mountain, <laughs> and um, but you hit that and it lifts you up, and you're weightless and it's silent, and the guy screaming "Run faster!" is silenced, <laughs> and it was incredible. And uh, oh my I God. just have had this sense of adventure my life has been an adventure i've had so many adventures my alaska stories i won't even get into mm -hmm. but uh i lived in alaska for a while and i am deeply adventurous and um and seize the moment yeah. seize yeah. the moment because you may not get another one and you're going to be sorry if you t if you miss so, out. So how how do you? I I I I I'm going to put you as the teacher, and here you're with you know, ten people, mm -hmm. and 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 nothing like this that you described. Nothing even close to this has ever happened in their life. Mm -hmm. Everything's gone pretty well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's gone pretty well. But what they recognize is they don't have this sense of urgency. They don't have this depth of gratitude and appreciation. They, they recognize it. They see it in you and they go, well, I, I, I could lie to you, but I, I just don't have it. But I want it. Mm -hmm. Do you need to go through this to get that? Of course not, thank goodness. Um, you don't want everybody going through a heart transplant. Okay. But do, you need to do, do you... hard things. You need to be uncomfortable. Okay. Don't sit on your couch and yeah. play video games your whole life and try to be comfortable. The, the, hmm. the purpose of life is not to be comfortable. The purpose of life is to be of service. Hmm. It's to be useful. Mm -hmm. You can't be useful if you have no skills, and you can't gain skills if you don't push yourself, if you don't do hard things. How are you ever going to know what's inside of you? How are you ever going to have confidence hmm. if you don't do things that mm -hmm. are hard? Mm -hmm. Get out there and do it. Right. Be uncomfortable. Take the ice bath. Push yourself too hard in your endeavor, your sport, your Something. whatever it is, right. go to power players. Hmm. Go to power players. Mm -hmm. Start there. Mm -hmm. Because what I learned about finance at power players changed my life from a, uh, from a financial perspective. It, it, put, it, it changed my whole trajectory from a financial perspective. But what I learned from a philosophical perspective, what I learned about getting uncomfortable, some people won't ever learn it another way. Mm -hmm. And even for me, mm -hmm. 
And my life has not been comfortable. I've had <laughs> challenge after challenge. I, should I say mean, not. I'm leaving so much out, it's not even funny. But like you, where would I even start, right? We right. have stories, right? Right. And, right. Um, and we know how to push ourselves and we know how to love what others won't tolerate. Won't tolerate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My favorite saying from you, Greg mm -hmm. learn to love what others won't tolerate. Mm -hmm. And um, hmm. do that. Do that. You know, Lori, right on my desk upstairs right now, I, I wish I could tell you the author, but I can tell you the name of the book. It's called The Comfort Crisis. Have you read it? Oh, I've not, but I will. Okay. I'm a reader. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not even a quarter of the way through it, and it's, I just keep nodding mm. my head like, oh, mm -hmm. my gosh. Oh, my gosh. You know, I, it, it's straightforward. It's easy to understand, but I, I couldn't agree more with every word I've read so far. Is that and right? what you just did is give a synopsis of the book that we will never know unless. And and the beautiful part is that this group that is, that's you got to you got to admit it. Like I've just never known anything like this that's pushed me. I don't feel this sense of life and urgency. Well, we get to choose. To choose to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, mm -hmm. you were forced into it, and you saw it coming. It, it was like, here you go. Here's your coming attractions. This is not going to be easy. Matter of fact, this could go all the way to the end and work out bad. Mm -hmm. it, it, and you watched it right in front of you with your dad and your sister. It, it didn't have a long run. And yet, here, outside of this heart condition, it's created in you a fearlessness that is allowing you to be an example of living this kind of fearless life. Mm -hmm. Because faith and fear, as you said, they don't coexist. Mm -hmm. you you got to choose one. And so, I, I don't know, if people can connect the dots here, this is, this is all you'll need to know to get going. And once you're going, once you're uncomfortable, once you're once you are living and pressing it and feeling that I'm I'm over my skis here, well, once you've felt it, it's hard to go back to normal. It is. It's like normal sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing good that happens there. There's no growth. There's no anything. It's the land of blah. You have never lived a minute there from snakes and boots and sticks to heart <laughs> situations and, and, and now leading the way in this. That's, and, and among so many other talents that we're going to get into, but quite honestly, when anybody thinks of Lori Ohm, this is what draws them is, is this courage, this fearlessness, this, this I'm taking life on head on, here we go, let's do it. Yeah. I wish I could put it in a, in a bottle or maybe make it into a video game and somehow <laughs> then people would absorb it. I don't know. I don't know. Jorge, figure that out. Video game, <laughs> video game. And that maybe that would, that would no. transfer it. I don't know. You know what I mean, though. Yes. It's, it's yes. Um, and here yet. you're an accomplished veteran <laughs> very successful in the corporate world. You, and we're going to get into that. You've got all of this experience behind you and this fearlessness. You see, I would contend, as you mentioned, power players, that it was too easy because all I needed to put in front of you is some tools. All of the mindset, the fearlessness, the I'm doing this, the proactivity, the self-motivation, all of that was already there. But the other thing I found there was a contingent of people hmm. who wanted a fearless life. Yeah. People who wanted to be more, and you are a leader. And, um, and certainly, uh, you have lived a fearless life. And, um, and, but there are many people, and certainly you included, that I'm still friends with from that group. Yeah. And there are times in your life where you will need someone to remind you who you are. Hmm. 
And I, uh, you know, Greg, you and I worked together in the last couple of years, and I needed someone to remind me who I was, hmm. if I'm being honest. Hmm. I, I got rolled hard mm -hmm. with my transplant. Mm -hmm. And I get back up every time I'm knocked down, but I got knocked down pretty dang hard. Mm -hmm. And I didn't need to learn about finance again. I needed someone to remind me who I am. Hmm. And um, thank you for doing that. Hmm. And that's something that came out of Power Players. Um, my hmm. brother did that for me too recently. Hmm. I had an encounter, as you will, when you're in the arena. I had an encounter that didn't go very well and I was upset about it. And my brother said, you go take care of this or I'm gonna come do it. Do I need to remind you who you are? And he had a conversation with me and reminded me who I am. And uh, I just needed to hear it. Sometimes you need to hear it. And so surround yourself with those people. When you, there will come a time when you need someone to remind you who you are. Yeah. I don't care how tough you are. None of us do it on our own. None of us. So community is very, Community, very important. absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Lori, in the real estate world, you've got a lot of different accomplishments. I, I want to hone in on on a particular niche that you have done very well at, um, the world of nightly rentals mm -hmm. and or short-term rentals. Um, I want you to talk about a couple of the deals that you've thought through from start to finish that... If if somebody would just do a few of these in their life, like you have, mm -hmm. it'd make all the difference in the world financially. Absolutely. Yeah. Walk through a couple deals with me. That's a great point. You don't have to have a hundred buildings to completely change your life, to to make enough money to change your kid's life. Right. Like after you're gone, yeah. to leave a legacy. Yeah. And um, you just buy well-situated properties. I came f home from power players and m propositioned a seller within a week of getting home from power players, had closed that deal within three weeks of <laughs> yeah. being home from power players. And I still own that house today. And um, that particular house, I... Um, rent to nurses. Mm -hmm. I have spent a lot of time in the hospital and these nurses, um, you know, they say the traveling nurses. We used a lot of traveling nurses through COVID and hospitals use a lot of traveling nurses. And they're like, we love Seattle, but you cannot find housing here. It's terrible. And so I just, you know, put my heart into creating the perfect house for, for nurses. And, um, it's never empty. It's always full. Always. There's always a waiting list. And I take really good care of them. I spoil them. And I enjoy doing it. But that house is maybe tripled. It's tripled in value since I bought it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and it makes these, you know, I, t I tried to get cash flow, more cash flow out of my properties the last couple of years. But the equity is amazing you know i've always been a buy and hold sean says i'm a good housekeeper i buy a house and i keep it <laughs> and uh and so i've been a buy and hold get rich slowly um as you said i had a corporate job and so i made i always made six figures i always had the money i needed um and real estate was really my like I said, it's it's part of who I am. Owning land is part of who I am, and um, and it's always been my hobby, and I love it. Uh, and uh, so that's one house. But of course, I've bought many, many more houses, and um, I've done it with owner financing. In that case, I I bought it with owner financing. Um, I've bought. I ended up buying the one right next door to it with owner financing. Oddly enough, I talked to one of my professors. Uh, I was getting appliances for the house and um, I had to look up the address on the county records at Sears and the, uh, and I saw the house next door was owned by this guy named Richard. And I thought, that's, I had a professor named Richard in college and uh, he was the head of the program, in fact. And he, actually he, I was the commencement speaker at, in, at my university and he was the one who 
elected me to do that. So he's a special person in my life. But um, I called him up. I said, oh, this is such a hoot. The person next door to this house I just bought, his name's Hacker. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's my house. I've owned that house for a long, long time. And <laughs> I've rented it, of course, because he lives up in a lot. Like, who would know, right? And um, I said, well, let me know if you ever want to sell it. He comes to town one day, and he said, I want to sell the house. He walks from his sister. She lives probably five miles. He walks everywhere, right? Um, just the healthiest guy. We, we used to hike these crazy mountains. The whole team of us would go hike these crazy mountains in Alaska. And uh, anyway, he walks up with his newspaper, comes into the kitchen table, sits down. Well, this is what I want for the house, and I I don't want any money down. I don't want to pay taxes on this house. And, uh, and uh, I own it outright. Uh, they're going to tax me on it. And uh, people, here's the, People think this never happens, Lori. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it does, All you it? have to do is yeah. know that it does happen, yeah. and it will happen. Right. You know? Yeah. You get yourself out there. Yeah. Uh, it's mindset. It's mm -hmm. a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. um, it's why just opening a book and learning the numbers isn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, <laughs> he opened, oh, okay, here are the interest rates. So this is what the interest rate is right now. I'll give you a little bit less than that. And we wrote up, we wrote it all up right done. there. Done. Done. <laughs> Seriously done. Yeah, right. Um, he didn't want to have to pay for the attorney. So I said, well, I'll have my attorney write it up. And, um, and that was fine and done. Yeah. I still have that house. Yeah. It's been a fantastic house. That house I may build an ADU on. It has a great big lot, mm -hmm. great place mm -hmm. in Kirkland. Um, they're really encouraging people to build more housing now. Um, I've built an ADU before, DADU rather, mm -hmm. detached, um, and I might do it on that property as well. I, but I, I know every home in your portfolio, and it's pretty amazing. Whole but foods I think right I know the door. two you just <laughs> described. And if I were to be conservative, the two you just described have equity in excess of a million dollars. Just those two. Oh. Yes. Just those two. And you see, so you think, well, wow, okay, let's go to a normal job and let's look at how long is it going to take you to be there, to do this, to do that, to put a million dollars of retirement, you know, funds away, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, here's, here's two homes managed properly at about a decade. There you go. Yeah, there you, you go. See? Done and done. And, and I, I don't know. I, I, you know, we sure we've had a big run of great appreciation, this and that, but you're buying in high demand locations where people think there's no way anybody's going to sell you an off market house in these locations, but everything you've bought is off market. They're all incredible. I have view homes. Yeah. I have, yeah. um, you know, really incredible homes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I worked a really well paying job that I, loved. Mm -hmm. I had a really great experience in corporate America. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of autonomy. Mm -hmm. I managed huge projects, mm -hmm. $100 million projects, doing construction projects, mm -hmm. uh, 90 people working for me, mm -hmm. tons of autonomy, tons of responsibility, right. which I like. Mm -hmm. I'm up for it. Mm -hmm. Darn but right not, I'm up for but it. Not but not very accommodating to 14 surgeries. Yeah. No, right. there came a time when I just couldn't do it anymore. Right. And yeah. um, and uh, when that happened, I had my real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something that I'd done in an average, I figured four hours a week mm -hmm. over the course of all of that time, mm -hmm. because there were when I was renting for, um, you know, just long term, mm -hmm. it's not hard. They call when the furnace breaks mm -hmm. or the roof. You, you know, or I go, I have to go replace a roof every once in a while, but it, it doesn't take a lot of my time. And, um, where I spend most of my time is in finance. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's the, that's the master skill mm -hmm. and, um, and with people and I love people. Mm -hmm. I truly love people. Mm -hmm. I am not somebody who wants to, I'm a win-win. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still in contact with all of the people that I've ever purchased owner financing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I went to see uh, Margie just recently. I, Barney has passed, uh, got that, that Kirkland house from Barney and Margie. And mm -hmm. I just love those two. What a gift they've mm -hmm. been in my life. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
but um, uh, yeah, I missed it when I had to leave corporate America, but I had this, and what a fallback, like all of my savings that I'd done through corporate America, all of my income that I'd made through corporate America doesn't come close to the equity I've made in, in my four hour week job. Tell me that the four hour week job is not doable. Right. You know, I of mean, it is. of course it is. When the average uh, American spends over four hours a day watching TV, which you don't. No, I do I not. don't, but there you go. Never There's have. your four hours a day. There Just you go. Just don't be average and, and learn a skill and apply yourself and do this. Yeah. I, yeah. There's no excuse for not being able to do this. Um, no. And, Something that I think, though, is just, <clears throat> to me, so many levels of inspiration. But, but even if it were hard, you do hard. Oh, you yeah. see, it's a mindset thing. It's a belief system. And, and it's one that your mom told you, and, and, and it's okay. We can do hard. And you've told me that you, you've taught your Absolutely. kids, yes, this is hard, but we can do hard. You see... To me, it, it all comes back to how you've, what you've agreed within your own mind, what you've said, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't created day one, you get to create it. You get to say what you believe and you can reinforce it. And then pretty soon you recognize by doing this, it sets me apart. It sets me apart. I'm winning because I think doing hard is an okay thing. Then mm -hmm. you learn to love to do hard. Yes, you do. You learn to mm -hmm. love when nobody else is around and you're the first one and the last one there. And this is becomes mm -hmm. your identity. To me, that's what's inspiring is we get to, to change to what works and we get what's what we put in. You know, you, you've earned everything you've got and then some. And, and I, although I know you have a lot of faith and you have a lot of humility and a lot of gratitude, at the same time, you don't sit around and hope things happen. <laughs> the no, opposite of that. No, I don't. Right? right. Oh, my God. Right. If you were to write a book, and I, I'm hopeful that that's not just a question out in the, in the middle, because I know right. you, I know you've... Well, it's up to you to, you know, kind of go here because I, I don't want to be okay. the first one to break the news. But what would that book, what would the theme of that book be? What would the title be? Uh, tell me about if you were to write a book, what would it look like? Well, I, um, I think it would be, it would be on this, this topic of, um, Putting yourself out there, life is precious. Get on it. Mm -hmm. in, um, mm -hmm. Get on it. You're not in, you're not doing yourself any favors by just easing through life. Um, be bold. Mm -hmm. um, get ready because life is a lot. It can be. It can come at you pretty darn hard, and you need to uh, be ready for that. And uh, hmm. I think it would be something like life is precious, you know. Hmm. It would be about... Um, the other thing that's very much in my heart is that um, organ donors save lives. Hmm. And hmm. I would like people to know the kind of life that an organ donor saved. And hopefully they feel that it was a life worth saving. And um, hmm. if a couple people were willing to check that box at the DMV and say, I'll do that, um, it would change lives. It would change families. And ultimately, that is the purpose of the book that I'm working on, is to say that um, this is the life that was saved by a donor. I would not be here today. I would have been long gone. And um, I'm so grateful. And other people can be a hero too. Other people can make, can hmm. do hard things. And one of those hard things is standing in a DMV on a Tuesday afternoon, 
and saying, yeah, if I wreck my motorcycle, I'll, uh, I'll be an organ donor. Or just think about your own mortality. That's hard. You don't want to have to think about your own mortality. Mm -hmm. um, or, uh, you know, it, it, I don't need to go further on that. Mm -hmm. But it's a decision that people can make that saves precious lives, lives that are worth saving. You know, Lori, one of the things that, that I think on a lot, and, and at least I try to, I try to, to put out there to motivate people is, is the concept. It has sort of three parts. One, the concept that, that this life that we get, it's, it's not all about you. It's, right. it, it's, it's about, it's about what are you leaving here? So where do you find the motivation to, to, to do extraordinary things? Well, it's, it's for others sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sure, we, we're, we're entitled to our, our own desire to do that, but sometimes what motivates, and I think every parent is motivated by, by showing and giving their kids an example of mm -hmm. this, okay? So we're motivated because people are watching. We're mm -hmm. motivated because people are watching. And if you don't think they're watching, they're watching. <laughs> okay, well, now I take this in my mind, this is where I'm segueing to, is that, is that here you have inside of you somebody else's heart. Mm -hmm. It's almost like here. This didn't work out for me, but would you run with this? Mm -hmm. Would you... Would you do right by this. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need somebody else's heart to feel that way because the gift of you get an opportunity to live, do right by it. Make the most of it. Mm -hmm. Sure, for you, but, but for everybody that is counting on you to deliver your verse, you know? And, and in, in a sense, you've got this double motivation because you've got all those reasons that anybody could and should have, but you also have to be motivated and thinking that I, I owe it to this person who gave me this next chapter mm -hmm. to, to do right by them, to live flat out, to utilize this gift in a way that that they would be proud of in a sense. I don't know, that's what's going through my head. Do you, do you feel any of that? Like literally, does that, does that cross your mind ever? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I would think it would have to, you know? Yeah, wow. All the time, mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. I've always felt a pressing sense of urgency. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from a very young age when the strongest man in the world left right. in an instant. And I recognized life is precious. There are no guarantees. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you the way that I've gotten through has often been through service because when you're hurting, self pity will destroy you. It will send you into a depression. It will, make you feel terrible about the world and there is nothing in self-pity that does anybody any good ever mm -hmm. if you w go help somebody mm. and that'll that's what will get you out of it mm -hmm. that's what will give you the gratitude again that's what will give you the strength to get out of bed um i go to the university of washington for my checkups and i walk around and i'll see and elderly lady pushing her uh, Down syndrome middle-aged child around to know that that will be her whole life is caring for she her child her child never grew up and moved out of the home you see people walking around with an external heart in the bag because their heart has completely failed and they are dependent on a pump outside of their body you see people who badly crippled young people mm -hmm. and you go wow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my day's not looking so bad right now mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and 
you know, if you're struggling, go help somebody, go get around those kind of people. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you a perspective Mm -hmm. that you need (laughs) Mm -hmm. if you start going into self-pity, because Mm -hmm. that's just, nobody needs that. There's a, there's a song. I'm going to, I'm going to get it wrong, but I think I can give you enough to look it up. There's a song, uh, Sarah, I believe it's pronounced Borales and John Legend. It's Mm. a duet between the two, and it's called A Safe Place to Land. And and the song starts with with the scene of what's happening, and it's it's just not good. Life has hit hard. Mm -hmm. Really hard things. Yeah. Hard things. It's a couple a couple verses of just really hard things like wow heavy hard things but it goes into this reprise that says okay now what and the and the reprise says be the hand to a hopeful stranger mm-hmm. a little scared but you're strong enough mm-hmm. be the light in the dark of someone's danger until the sun comes up. Mm. And it repeats that like six times. What you just said, how do you cure this this rough place? How do you get through? Take your eyes off yourself Mm -hmm. and go give. That's right. Go be that person that you would want in your own life. Go do that. And in the doing of it, you come alive. Exactly. And the helping. It, it, it's exactly what you said in a song form. It's one of the most beautiful songs mm-hmm. you've ever heard in your life. Mm-hmm. But, but it's what you just said. I'll make sure I send a link to you tonight. You can listen Thank to you. it on your way home because Thank you'll listen to it again and again. Yes. It will make you cry. I'm not kidding. Okay. It's one of those songs. <laughs> but but, like but you're, so, you're so wise in that. The, 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 the pity place does nothing for anyone, including yourself. The giving place, Mm -hmm. the reaching out place. Um, A.B., A.B., uh, one of the famous quotes, I'm not sure where he heard it. He said something to the effect that I I bemoaned the the reality that I had no shoes. And then before me, Mm -hmm. a man with no feet. I've heard that one. It's and I, very and good. I'll never forget very him good. telling me that, mm. but it's just what you're saying is mm-hmm. that, you know, look around. Yes. There's ways to have perspective and faith. It's really beautiful. Really yes. beautiful. Lori, we started with the word heart. Yes. Boy, I'll tell you something. We'll never do a podcast ever here where anyone will have any question as to why that word was chosen. (laughs) Um, But I think that what I want to transition is from the physical heart that you've so described and the challenges and what you've overcome to, to the other part that, that really poses the challenge and the consider part of this for everybody. It's that, what I've witnessed from day one with you is that you are an all-in person. If your entire heart isn't moving in this direction, there's no way it's going to get a minute of your attention. Your, your whole heart. And I've watched your heart for Sean. I've watched your heart for your kids. I've watched your heart for creation and philanthropy and giving. And there's never been anything I've ever seen you do where you're like partially in. (laughs) Your whole heart's in it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the consider challenge that we're going to put a bow on this podcast with is is to challenge people to think about their heart. What is it that they're all in, Mm -hmm. completely committed to? What, What is it that they're willing to completely dedicate themselves to with their whole heart? Because partially in, you might as well not even step through the door. I really believe that. And I think that you live that. Absolutely. And you live it in every way. Your heart, that's the word that, that I will always think of when I think of you. Thank you. 
for being here. This is this is going to be a deep ocean one for people. It's a lot to consider. Tell people how they can stay in touch with you. What's the best way to contact you? Is there an email? Is there oh, a, sure. a, anything um, that they can reach out to you? I know people will want to. Oh, that's that. What a gift. That's very kind. My, um, uh, you can reach me by my email or my phone number. And my email is just my name, L O R I dot U L M, as in Mary, at live. L-I-V-E dot com. Mm -hmm. Lori dot Olam at mm -hmm. live dot com. Yep. Yes. I'm, I, I'm a 206 person. Uh -huh. <laughs> 206-954-0918. You know, <clears throat> this podcast, we talked about it in podcast zero. As soon as you hit send, it's out to the world the airwaves, mm -hmm. God only knows where it might end up. Mm -hmm. And so it also speaks of your courage and just a willingness to say, yeah, this is me. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. My request is, 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 is show courtesy, show kindness. No, there's no guarantees that the world does that. You, you've seen it all. You'll handle it. But I thank can handle you. it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your willingness to put your heart out there for all of us to benefit. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, you being here. Um, and for you being with us at this podcast, um, thank you so much. You've got a lot of things you could be doing right now. And so thank you yeah. for watching this. And um, until the next podcast, this is Greg Pinio. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thanks.